Hello gamers of YouTube. Today I'm going to review Fallout 3, or I mean Wasteland 2, the director's cut. I had a little hiccup there because this game is more like Fallout than the Bethesda releases that bear the name Fallout. I'm not complaining about Bethesda Fallout games though because I've played all of them and thoroughly enjoyed every one of them. You can even watch my Fallout 4 review to see what I mean. I really love those games. That being said, Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 were not first-person shooters like the more recent Bethesda releases. As a matter of fact, I would say that if you didn't get the chance to play the original Fallout games and would like to experience something very similar, Wasteland 2 is the way to go. I should mention that one of the key creators from the Fallout series, Brian Fargo, was involved with Wasteland 2 as well and it would be safe to assume that his fingerprints in the original Fallout games were a major influence over what that franchise was all about, and the same fingerprints are all over Wasteland 2, the director's cut. I was very apprehensive about ordering this game because I had read a lot of very mixed reviews. People either loved it or hated it, and the number of reviews reporting technical issues and bugs delayed my purchase even longer, especially since the last thing I want is to buy something and not even be able to play it. That being said, I stumbled across an amazing deal and bought the game as a digital download for my Mac. When I opened it up, I was surprised, but pleased, to see that it was actually a bundle that included the original Wasteland game as well as Wasteland 2, the director's cut. I wasted, uh, no pun intended, a few hours playing the original game so I could try to remember what it was like. Did games really look like this in the 1980s? So I'm happy to say I have dozens of hours of playtime at this point and have experienced zero problems with the game. I have no idea what other people were complaining about, especially people who griped about the Mac version being riddled with bugs. Maybe they were using obsolete computers that don't meet the game's requirements or I'm not sure, I mean, I'm using a 2014 MacBook Pro, as seen here in the picture, and like I said, I've had no problems at all, and I have many hours into this. Anyway, on to the main event here. Like my other reviews, this one will focus mainly on game mechanics and some tips, and I'm going to try very hard not to have any spoilers in it. So let's talk a little bit about the graphics. The graphics are good, but sometimes it's hard to see what you need to see, and I found myself having to turn the camera around constantly so that I don't miss things, and in some cases it has hindered the advancement of the story because I missed something pretty important because, you know, there was a cliff in the way or something like that. One thing I really like is that it feels like a wasteland. The map is pretty big, but there isn't a whole lot on it, just like I'd expect after a nuclear holocaust. I commented on my Fallout 4 review that the world in that game has way too much going on and far too many people. Wasteland 2 is not like that. It's a vast open desert set in post-apocalyptic Arizona and it feels like it. I mean, there, there's not really a lot there. Outdoor travel consists of what you see here. It's a badge and a big plain map. You get random encounters and you can stumble across treasure caches and traveling vendors, temples, that kind of thing. There are also oases that are placed in a way to make it fairly easy not to run out of water. And you do need to carry water, just like you would in a real wasteland. It's always a good idea to top off your canteens if you see an oasis, because if you run out of water, you start taking damage and eventually die. So you have to reload whatever your last save was if that happens. The outdoor map leads you to more detailed areas like this, where the storyline progresses the most. Don't let the simple appearance fool you. There's a lot to discover on a map like this, and the writers have placed a large variety of obstacles in your way so that you need a good variety of skills to get past them. Speaking of skills, the skill tree consists of dozens of skills and can be broken up into three categories combat skills, knowledge skills, and general skills. 
Luckily, you get four PCs on your team, and it is absolutely a necessity to have them specialize in different areas. PCs gain skill points, constitution, usually called hit points in most games, and something called perks that will enhance their abilities. Read these and choose very carefully because if you try to specialize in too many things with each character, you'll become a jack of all trades and a master of nothing and it will make progressing very difficult. So be careful when you're choosing how to do this and maybe even read up on what other people have done if you don't have a lot of experience in games like this. So let's talk a little bit about the items that you find and the loot that you'll come across in your travels. You need to equip your PCs with various types of weapons and apparel to brave the environment and the opposition they're going to face in combat. The weapons can be modified to become more effective by applying mods using the Weaponsmith skill. And guns also require specific ammunition. And if you run out, you're basically fighting with your hands. So you probably will want your combat specialist to carry a gun and a melee weapon, you know, like a club or a pipe or axe, whatever you can find. That way, if they run out of ammunition or the gun jams at a really bad time, they can just switch to their melee weapon and pound away at the opponents. Armor can't really be modified, but it is crucial to your survival in combat. Some of the armor has strength requirements, so it is not really feasible to make all your PCs look like armored tanks. During your travels, you'll also come across what they call trinkets. These items generally give you skill bonuses and usually come with a drawback as well, so you'll want to choose wisely. Junk can be found everywhere in your travels and can be sold to most vendors you come across. And sometimes what appears to be junk can be sold to specific vendors for a lot more than if you just get rid of it at the first vendor you run into. My recommendation here is to sell junk at every opportunity, especially early on. That way you can generate as much income as possible to purchase better equipment and you won't be hauling around a bunch of crap for no reason. Eventually you'll discover which NPCs pay more and then you can save that particular kind of junk for those NPCs at that time. Quest items are labeled as such and should probably never be sold. Sometimes they can't be sold. I think I mentioned something about perks before, and the way to unlock some of the more specific perks is by reaching a certain level of proficiency in one of your specialized abilities. The development menu shows you how many ability points you need and which perk is unlocked at any given level. And you can see it in this menu here. The little dots along your progression here indicate a point in advancement where you unlock a perk. So, and perks are not granted as often as points. You get points at every level. Perks you get, I think it's every third or fourth level. Another important thing to remember with this game when it comes to character development is to use your radio to call into your headquarters. That's how you level up. You're granted what they call a field promotion when you have enough experience, and like I mentioned a minute ago, that'll get you constitution points or hit points as well as ability points and in some cases perks. Combat takes place in a turn-based tactical system like the original Fallout series had, where you get a specific number of action points each round, and you can carry out a limited number of actions based on that number of points. Everything you do carries an action point cost, so you have to be very careful what you're choosing to do. Even switching weapons or, or squatting down to get a better shot costs you action points, so make sure you plan your actions very carefully. One cool thing I've appreciated is that the developers give you two borders in combat each round. This blue one is the maximum distance you can move and still have the ability to attack with whatever weapon you're holding. And the bigger yellow one is the maximum distance you can move. Sometimes it's better to run for cover so you don't end up being a sitting duck because you're gun jammed or you failed to take out your target with that one shot you had. So again, you have to think and plan very carefully and strategically. I like that. A lot of fights take longer this way, but I find the use of strategy and turn-based combat systems like this very enjoyable. So I, I know that I haven't covered things in a lot of depth, but as I said before, I'm trying to not give you any spoilers or give away the storyline much. 
So, like with most of my reviews, I'm focusing mainly on the mechanics of the game. And I'd say overall the game is very enjoyable. It's a great reminder of where everything RPG fans enjoy today came from. Early RPGs like Ultima and Wasteland led to games like Fallout and Baldur's Gate and really pushed the industry to new heights. I've only completed about the first half of the game so far, so keep that in mind when you hear these criticisms I'm about to talk about. I really have only two main complaints. I found it a little challenging to figure out what to do next, and I don't know if it's because I've become accustomed to having the quest locations spoon-fed to me with little markers on the map, or maybe I just wasn't focused on things because my busy production schedule with other video projects I have. But I had to resort at times to looking up hints on the internet because I had run out of ideas of how to move forward. I think this is what they mean when they say it's an open world. In this case, it's open in the sense that you're not directed clearly to a specific place in order to move the story forward. Unlike some games where open world means you can go anywhere and do anything without getting bored because there are so many side quests, if you don't want to get bored in Wasteland 2, you have to follow the story, and to follow the story, you really need to pay attention to the conversation threads you have with the NPCs. New stuff does not get unlocked, and you can't progress very far unless you pay attention. The other sort of minor complaint I have is with the variety of enemies you face. It seems pretty limited. I know this game isn't Fallout, but I miss the random encounters with things like Death Claws or Aliens. They just had a more interesting variety in the original Fallout games that I think Wasteland 2 Director's Cut could benefit from. The fights are pretty monotonous. Mostly you get raiders or one of about maybe three different kinds of animals. And you know, something I found sort of surprising is that I haven't run into a single giant scorpion or radiated ant, <laughs> you know? At least not yet. I don't know where the scorpions are. I mean, this is Arizona after all, right? Shouldn't they have lived? Even roaches or something, right? Like rad roaches in Fallout? Anyway, uh, I find myself running away from most of the random encounters on the world map. Not because I'm afraid to get my party killed, but because I just don't want to waste the time fighting the same opponents on the same randomly selected but reused maps. This game costs about $40 in most places and most platforms that I've found it for. I paid a lot less than that for mine. I, I must have really stumbled across a really good deal because I paid maybe about a third of that, I think it was like 13 or $14. So, but that being said, even if I had paid $40, I think I'd be satisfied with the purchase. It'll give you somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 hours of gameplay, according to what I've read, and it's very addictive. I mean, once you figure out what you need to do, you have to get that one more thing done right before you stop. <laughs> <laughs> or go back and sell all your equipment so you can be ready for the next adventure, that kind of thing. So I would say if you like Fallout or you like this sort of post-apocalyptic thing or if you like role-playing turn-based combat, I think you'll really like this. The, the variety of weapons and stuff is satisfying. The graphics are really good. I think if you're a fan of the original Fallout series, there's a lot to like about this game. And even if you're a fan of the current Fallout from Bethesda, it might be fun to play this game to see sort of where that spawned from. That's it for this review. Be sure to subscribe if you like my content. I really would appreciate that. And hey, make it a great day.